Welcome everyone, good evening. I'm Janelle Gurley, Director of Science and Programs at Brian Mitchell Association, and it is an earnest pleasure to welcome back Dr. Richard Blundell with us this evening to present Why Science Matters and share his thoughts with us this evening. And before we begin, I would like to thank Bank of America, our lead sponsor, as well as our alternate sponsor, Cisco, Bre Cisco Brewers of Nantucket and the White Elephant Hotels and Resorts of Nantucket and Palm Beach. It is without further ado that I quickly turn everyone over to Dr. Blundell after a brief bio to introduce him very quickly. Dr. Blundell is a scientist, an adventurer, a philosopher, and a surfer. He has developed OICA as a living philosophy that draws on deep ecological principles and cosmic evolution to be a source of wisdom for our time. Or rather, he has developed OICA as a living philosophy that draws a deep ecological, on deep ecological principles, rather, and cosmic evolution to be a source of wisdom for our time. <laughs> Without further ado, Dr. Richard Blundell. Welcome. How are you? <laughs> Good. Thank you, Janelle. Sorry for that mouthful. That's that's my new bio. So you kind of surprised me with that one, but well done. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, we are blessed yeah. to have you. Thank you. Uh, great. So I guess I just want to jump right into it. Uh, how do I get back to my... Share you start screen? sharing again. Uh, okay. You'll trump me in that area. Okay. Where'd it go though? <laughs> For some reason it's not about. Hmm. Stand by. Are you seeing that now? Why science matters? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, great. Um, so yeah. Um, I just wanted to start off again. Thank you. And um, I want to start off by saying that this isn't really going to be, you know, a highly technical or hardcore science uh, lecture, uh, as the name suggests. It's going to be more about um, why an exploration of why science matters, and especially um, it's an ex exploration of how science matters to me um, personally. How how I've developed uh, a tendency to derive meaning and um, value out of science. Um, but I don't want it to, and just so we know what we're looking at here, this is it. This is really in a, a I was going to say in a nutshell, but more really in a spiral um, shell shape. Um, this is really it. This is where um, I go for what matters. Uh, this is a, a depiction of the story of the entire story of the universe. And um, we're going to get into this later, but I just wanted to show it to you to, just to sort of introduce it um, because this is going to be where we're going to, we're going to spend the evening um, in, in this story of the cosmos. Um, but I also don't want this to be, you know, a kind of self-indulgent exercise in you know, how, how I see science and how I derive meaning from science. So I wanted to take a moment first to really frame this question of why science matters in the predicament, in the circumstances of our time, which are, um, I, the word that comes to mind is dire, you know, that, that we, we are living in a time of profound change. And um, I think it's, important that we seek sources of wisdom and meaning in addition to just knowledge. And so that's what I'd like to f spend a few minutes doing is a kind of deep dive, dive into what I mean by mattering when I say why science matters and um, explore that a little bit first to set the context. Um, and, and again, it's the context of, of our current situation, which we can get a sense for our, what our situation is by flipping through this report, which is a report of the global risks of 2023, some of these existential um, risks that face humanity in our time. 
And one of the pages that stood out to me was this one. It's kind of a topological map of some of the big problems. I don't expect you to really see this or be able to, to read it or make all the connections. But what this is, it's kind of a explosion in a spaghetti factory of big, complex, intractable problems all interacting with each other in a way that creates the the the, the crisis that we're in. Um, and I, I find it, um, you know, everything from environmental problems to economic and to social and technological problems that are all depicted on this on this graphic in when I was doing my PhD in uh, big history, um, the frame that I used to describe this intractable situation was the wicked problem. And then I actually discovered a higher degree of wicked problems called the super wicked problems. And this is kind of what describes the current situation. We are in a super wicked problem. And one thing that I find interesting though, in this graphic is the big thing that's missing that you may have heard about lately. And that's this artificial intelligence. It's not even on this graphic. And I don't know if anyone here is paying attention to recent developments. I'm sure you've probably all heard of chat GPT and large language models and that sort of thing. Um, but if you are listening, you will be hearing a lot of really intelligent people very much in positions of authority and power and privilege saying pretty profoundly terrifying things about what could happen in the face of this new technological advancement. It's hard to get your, your head around the possible scenarios through which this new technology could play out. It really puts things at risk. It puts things into existential risk, in fact. And um, so I wanted to add this to the list of things that that matter and that that I think that an understanding of science in the way that I'm going to present it tonight could help us to make sense of of this map and especially this AI um, element. Um, there is a word for this, another word for this, so you wouldn't have to be calling it super wicked problems. We, they call it the meta crisis. Um, so let's take a little look at what people mean by this idea of a meta crisis. Um, this is a guy who's a monk and a podcaster, and he says, the meta crisis is the multiple overlapping and interconnected global crises that our nascent planetary culture faces. It's a pretty good, succinct description of what we're facing. Here's one that's a little bit more in depth. We may be thinking of it as an ecological crisis. We may be thinking of it as a psychological or spiritual crisis. We may be thinking of it as a cultural crisis and a breakdown of community, family, et cetera. We may be thinking of it as a crisis of government and economics and finance. And it is all of these things, but it's not reducible to any of them. That's why it's a meta crisis. This is Terry Patton, who's a technologist. Um, okay, and we could get even deeper. I know these are long, but bear with me. This is Zach Stein, an educational educational philosopher, saying there are the ecological, economic, immigration, geopolitical, and energy crises, but there are also there is also an invisible crisis unfolding within our own minds and cultures that is getting much less attention. This is the meta crisis, which has to do with how humans understand themselves and the world. It is a generalized educational crisis involving a set of related psychological dynamics systems and societies are in trouble, but it is the psyche, the human dimension, that it is in the direst of straits. So you're starting to get a sense for like the true complexity of this and the, the breadth and the depth to which this crisis reaches. And here's another one. And this is from a friend and someone that I've, that I've had some good conversations with, John Verveke. He's a cognitive scientist. So get ready for this. He says, we're in a meaning crisis. I think this pretty much sums it up. It's very simple. It's succinct. It's saying we've lost our capacity or sources of meaning. And this is really where I want to go with this, I, with this idea of why science can matter. I think it can matter precisely in this 
dimension of the meaning of the meta crisis? How can we derive meaning from science? This is one way that science matters. So before we go a little further, I just want to make a little bit of a distinction between what I'm what between knowledge and meaning, because I am talking about science, and science is typically um, associated with knowledge. We use science as a way to generate knowledge. And because I'm going to be talking about meaning, I think it's it's worthwhile to stop and just sort of do a quick analysis of what the difference between knowledge and meaning. And to do that, I want to first make a distinction between knowledge and wisdom. And for that, I want to start here. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. And so here's some scientific descriptions. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. So that's, I think that that kind of captures the essence of what we're talking about here. Knowledge we get, we can take things apart, we can put them into diagrams, we can explain things, we can see how the parts fit together, but that doesn't capture the essence of what a tomato would taste like in this. You just don't do that. The Italians know this when they, you know, this. They, you just don't put it to, it's like putting garlic on peanut butter. Does doesn't do it. So this is, so it's a little bit ambiguous and science, science isn't comfortable with amb ambiguity. The whole point of science is to kind of take away the ambiguity. And so that's why there's tension in this conversation. But I think we need to soldier through the tension and see if we can't still work toward meaning. So I'm going to continue this line of investigation to explore a little bit more about the meaning of meaning. What does it mean? Um, so here's a good description. The meaning, meaning is the web of connections, understandings, and interpretations that help us comprehend our experience and formulate plans, directing our energies to the achievements of our desired futures. Meaning provides us with the sense that our lives matter. That's pretty good. I can, you know, I can live with that and keep that. I can keep that. I can hold that as I explore the science of cosmic evolution. To go further about the value of meaning. So this is going to be my quick and dirty science of meaning slide. So what we're going to do. So, you know, there's I've, I've seen this uh, a meta analysis of all the different ways in which this concept of meaning brings value to people. So there's been all these studies that they did where they ask people how does me and I'll not just ask people, but they've done you know quantitative studies about how meaning serves people in life and here are some of the here's some of the the quantitative you know published results of meaning of uh, meaning in life studies um, meaning in life predicts a higher quality of life higher life satisfaction a state of general health higher occupational adjustment lower incidence of psychological disorders meaning in life predicts lower suicidal ideation it, it predicts more social appeal. It uh, is related to slower age-related cognitive decline and lower risk for Alzheimer's disease. It uh, pre it predicts a decreased mortality, which is kind of a general way of saying it keeps you alive longer. And it even lowers the risk of heart attack. So there's a scientifically validated um, literature on the value of meaning in life, okay? But that's not really what I'm talking about. Um, in any case, moving on, here's a quote for you. We're not exactly sure where meaning comes from, if it is inherent, or if it is real at all. What we do know is that humans flourish when they have it and suffer when they don't. I like that. That works too. I can, I can use that. The point here is that meaning is important, and if we don't have it, we suffer. Um, so let's just sum up this. Um, um, these are some of the things that that you know I think about when I when I sort of try to when I try to define meaning. I believe that that meaning includes an inner dimension. In other words, that it's knowledge that has some relevance to me. Um, that's one thing that makes knowledge meaningful. Um, so in other words, meaning has an identity component. 
I'm laying these out because I'm going to be telling the story of the universe in a little while. And I want these ideas to be with us as we walk through that story. Uh, so it has an identity component. There's something in the science I can identify with. And also that meaning has a narrative dimension to it. There's lots of research out there and there's a lot of evidence just in culture that we're very much a storytelling species. And our narrative is at the heart of how we make sense of the world. It's how we derive meaning. It's how we make meaning. It's central to how human beings function. And so it makes sense then that any meaning that we're going to derive has got some narrative component or narrative dimension to it. So what are some of the different sources of meaning? Obviously, lots of people derive meaning from religion. Uh, and there are myths that also um, um, account for a lot of meaning, whether it's identified or not in our culture. History is a huge source of meaning for people. National and ethnic identities generate and maintain meaning for people. Spiritual traditions are a huge source of meaning. I work with a lot of philosophers and I see them deriving an incredible amount of meaning from their philosophical commitments. But then there's science. Science by its very nature is not supposed to be a source of meaning. Science is, this whole point of science is to remove meaning from its, from its pursuit. It's to say, I'm going to look at the world objectively. I'm going to remove any preconceived notions of meaning, preconceived values, preconceived biases. I'm going to try and remove those from the pursuit so that I can do, get to the truth. And as a scientist, I totally appreciate and can, and, and can try to honor that, that, um, that commitment. But I do think that we are we're throwing out the baby with the bathwater in some sense. That's not to say that I that I don't want to do good science or I don't think that the scientific method is valid. I do. I just think that we need to develop ways of, or at least comfort with being able to derive meaning from scientific knowledge. That's the point here. So now I want to get back to this. Um, again, this is the story of the cosmos in a spiral. Uh, just briefly, you can see in the middle there, there's a little white dot that's supposed to represent the Big Bang. And then this story unfolds in a uh, counterclockwise direction out from there. And it unfolds through the early physics of the universe into, you know, early celestial and stellar dynamics. And then you start, you can really start to see galaxies and stars and how they form. And then down toward the bottom there in the middle, you see an orange thing, that's the sun. And then you, I'm sorry, that's the, um, that's actually the pro protoplanetary disc. We're going to stop there. And then you can see the earth and the moon crashing into the earth. And then, and then you can really start to see the history of life on earth. It turns blue. And then there's all kinds of mountain building, building events and glaciation events. And it, as it comes around down through the bottom, life really gets kicks in. You can see the Cambrian explosion down there toward the bottom and then up toward the right, you know, colonization of the land and you see the diversification of life you can even see that big yellow thing in there in the middle that's the asteroid that took out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago diversification of mammals hominids on up to and that you can just barely see this little gray area in that top right corner uh, of a city so that represents sort of civilization so this is it this is the whole story of the universe and what, what i'd like to do on this is you watch this we're going to I've created a narrative, a through line that will trace this story. And I've mapped out one, two, three, four, five stops along the way. And what we're going to try to do is see if we can derive meaning from these five stops. I could have picked a lot of other stops. I mean, this is an incredibly rich story. There's so much detail and so many, there's a lot of science in this diagram. We could have stopped anywhere, but I've picked five, just almost at random, but I think that they represent moments in the history of the universe where there happens to be a particularly rich source of meaning to be had. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to start at the Big Bang, work our way through, stop at each one of these places. I'm not going to go deep into the science, but I'm going to try and give just enough 
so that we might be able to derive some meaning from that. All right. Oh, so before we go, I just want to keep these points in mind. What we're going to be looking for as we do this is coherence. We're trying to see how all these things string together in, in a coherent way. We're looking for connections, things that can connect the things that we're talking about to each other and to us. So connecting us to the world and each other. We're going to see if there's any purpose. In other words, we're looking for instances of, of causal continuity when one thing causes another and causes another and causes another, and eventually it comes to cause us. That's called purpose. See if there's any significance. See if there's anything that feels gratifying in the process. Look for instances of things of relevance that we feel to ourselves. And here's a really important one to see if we can't find instances where or something pops out that really reveals that we have a shared legacy and fate. Okay, meaning of meaning, sorry, one more. Again, we've already done the science of meaning. So from now on, we're not doing the science of meaning. I'm not talking about the science of meaning. I'm talking about the meaning of science. So we begin, we start in the Big Bang and we're gonna go to stop number one. I usually start this whole story in a place called mystery. For, for reasons that are hard to understand, there's actually built-in um, checks on how much we can know, the, the resolution by which we can know things. And because of that check, because of that sort of that uh, limit on what we can know, there's a mystery that's built into the universe. I like to acknowledge it because it keeps me humble. But then we have this event, usually referred to as the Big Bang, when there was this rapid inflationary period and the, the universal forces of the universe got, got themselves sorted out and um, things started to happen from there. We've got a pretty good picture of, of the cosmos um, that, we've, that we've been able to um, um, compose. And what this is, it's an image, it's a, just a graphic of the entire sort of spatial representation of the universe, looking at the big bang on the left, uh, which is that bright thing and then the period of inflation. And then you see this bright disc. So what we're looking at here is imagine being that satellite on the right there. And I'm going to tell you about that in a second. And looking to the left and you're looking down this funnel through all of space and you're looking back through all of those different um, stars and globular clusters and galaxies. And, and, and then eventually you get to this clear place where there's the dark ages before the first stars formed. And then eventually you hit this, this disc of blue light that you can see there. That's what we're going to be looking at next. That's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. That's the first stop on this tour of, of meaning making through the universe. So what are we looking at? I think it's helpful to understand, to understand what we're looking at. It's really helpful to understand how we took this picture. This is a picture of, of some of the, of the cosmic microwave background radiation. And this next little graphic is going to show you how we took that picture. So this is a satellite. It's called the Planck satellite. It sees the world in, in the microwave band. So it doesn't look invisible light. It looks in microwave light. We sent it up into orbit and it spins. So it's out there spinning around and it's taking these pictures, this, this sort of continuous picture of space. You take that picture that it's taken, this spherical picture, put it flat. It looks like an oval. Then you start to remove all the different sources of, you know, errant light, errant radio signals and things like that. And as you, you do that, you peel away all those different things and you correct for all the different mistakes and you find that image. So the way to think about this is that if you were standing on the surface of the earth and you, you could look out with your eyes tuned into microwave band of light, this is what you would see. You'd see this background behind everything of this early light of the universe, which is seen in the microwave from here on Earth. That's what we're looking at right there. Um, so what is the meaning? Like the idea here is this is all science. You know, it's basically a picture of the minute differences in temperature of the early universe. This is about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Uh, so it's a it's a very, very early picture. You know, it's, it's a baby picture of the earliest light of the universe. But what we now know is that 
this light evolved into everything that is. So if you look around the room that you're in right now, all the things that are in it evolved from this, from this, from the, this light and this, these, this energy and this matter, this hydrogen and helium under the forces, the, the universal forces of gravity and electromagnetism and nuclear forces come together in certain ways to create stars. Those stars create atoms, atoms reconfigure themselves over 13.8 billion years into your sofa. This is like, so this light here that you're seeing eventually becomes the matter that we deal with every day. Talk about why science matters. Like this is the light that becomes the matter that we live with. Okay. And we see that happen. So what, what I'm going to do here is show you how as that, remember, this is a, this was a very hot time in the universe. So as that cools, what we see happening in the, in the background of that image is that it all kind of sort of coalesces into these tendrils of what we call the large scale or mega scale structure of the unit. Actually, as I'm looking at that, I'm realizing that's not the image. Um, that is actually the brain scan of a rat. I always use the wrong image, but you might see why, because this is actually what it looks like. The point there is that <laughs> neural networks look a lot like the large scale structure of the universe. Be that as it may, I'm not trying to make meaning there. I'm just trying to show that there's 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 deep symmetries and um, that are really interesting. So this is what we call the, the, the mega scale structure of the universe. And as this evolves, and I'll, I'll let this, this is a simulation you know, an accurate scientifically evidence-based simulation of how that large scale structure of the universe coalesces into these tendrils. And then you'll start to see, you know, galaxies forming, galaxy clusters. I'm sure there's lots of globular clusters in there as well. But what you're seeing here is the evolution of the night sky as we would know it. So if you could go out tonight and see the night sky, you'd see this. But what this actually is, again, is the evolution of that cosmic microwave background radiation. This is what the night sky that you could see tonight evolved from. Okay, It's kind of a blueprint. It's kind of a blueprint of the night sky. But I want to go back to what I said earlier about what we're actually looking at. Again, we're trying to derive meaning, right? So this, the, these are... This is a picture taken in microwave light. The differences in color represent differences in temperature or differences in energy, the vibrational energy. If there hadn't been those differences in temperature, in other words, if this had been a completely uniform gray as opposed to, you know, had these ripples, had these splotches, there would have been nothing happening because one part of the cosmos would have been precisely the same temperature as the other part of the cosmos, and there would have been no impulse for anything to change. There would have been no gradient. If there was no gradient, that means there's no relationship. This, this, is, this is really profound, because what it's actually saying is that all the complexity of the universe, all the complexity of this world that we inhabit comes to us, comes into existence through ecological dynamics. My point is this, why science matters. In this case, what this science is telling us is that the cosmos that we live in is an ecosystem. The cosmos is ecological. In other words, relationships are everything. I mean, think about that. What matters? What matters to you? What matters to us are relationships, the relationships that we are in. That's that's scientifically accurate to say right back to the beginning of the cosmos. We live in a cosmos where relationships matter even before there was anybody to talk about our relationships. Before, before the first breakup, relationships mattered. We live in a we live in a cosmos where relationships matter, and that's why they still matter to us today. Okay, next step uh, or next stop on this journey through the cosmos, I decided we would look at this period here, which is probably about 
uh, 4.7 billion years ago, uh, which is called uh, an era where the protoplanetary disk of the solar system formed. Okay, so I'm skipping a lot of science here, but we're going to jump right into this moment here. So this is an artist's depiction of our star, the sun. And what we're seeing here, which is really cool, are these rings. Let's start the motion here. So what we see is this thing spinning through the laws of conser the conservation of angular momentum. And if you look carefully, you'll start to see these little celestial bodies start to appear in the little alleys, in those clearing out alleys. And what's happening is that you've got all these dynamics at play. You've got this the photons streaming off of this star, creating what's called the solar wind. And that's pushing any vapor and any um, gases away. It's pushing it out into the outer. You can kind of see the shadows behind these planets. And so what's happening here is that you've got the solar wind pushing gases and everything out into the outer reaches of the of the solar system. And in so so in close, things get really dry because the water, water vapor, gets pushed out along with all the other gases. Now this makes sense that the inner planets then would be kind of rocky and dry. And that's what we see. Mercury and Mars, those are really rocky planets. They're dry. And then as you get further out, further and further, you start to see the gaseous giants. So you get, you know, Jupiter and 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 Saturn and Nep these these uh, gaseous planets. So there's this complex ecological dynamics again, relationships happening between these bodies and their and their star. And what's profound here is that that little third one, that little what should probably be a rocky planet, you know, which should probably be pretty dry because it's so close to the sun, it ends up having some special treatment, some some odd um, scenario, some odd um, constellation of factors made it so that it had water, like it's it's a, it's a little bit inexplicable that that our planet would have so much water and the point here is just that to know that you know astronomers and and planetary physicists and things have been contemplating and 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 modeling and and wondering about how could it be how could this planet be so just so improbable that water would exist in in all three phases it's just it, it's kind of mind-blowing the the improbability of circumstances that have to align for a planet like ours to come into existence it's just such an oddball now of course we don't know that we're the only planet with water or we, we, you know we can almost say for certain we're not and we but but we're the only planet we know of with life. And so, but now we've launched this, this new satellite, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is actually the really fascinating thing here is that ever, before now, all we've really had by way of trying to explain how our planet could have these special circumstances where it has all this abundance of water were through models and the models never really were satisfying. But now because of the James Webb Space Telescope, we're actually starting to be able to actually visibly see this thing. So I'm gonna just let this visualization play because we're, we've aimed this satellite now at this one of these protoplanetary disks, PDS-70, and we're starting to analyze what we see. And what we are starting to see is that we can, because it's an infrared, a telescope it uses infrared light we can begin to see how water is distributed in these protoplanetary disks and so we're starting to get this confirmation through this detailed study of of spectrometry within these planetary systems that it makes sense so i just want to stop now and just start to think about like well why does this matter like so why does science why does science matter in this case well, I think Carl Sagan said it best when he said, the earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. He goes on to say, 
There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and to cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. What he's, what he's, what he's encountering there is the sheer um, fascination at the just vast improbability of a planet like Earth and all of the science that we are now compiling to tell this history of the Earth and the story of the Earth's formation, it all comes into coherence. All the models now make better sense and we can see clearer and clearer every day just how rare and precious and unique and precarious our position is. And so what is this saying? And we, and, you know, we use this new telescope to look out and we, we see, we're starting to see lots of planets, you know, we're starting to see lots of, of, of potential planets that could harbor life, but, but nothing yet, you know, and it just goes to show that, you know, look, we are either the only form of life in the cosmos in which case, man, we represent the only life in the cosmos. Or there is life in the cosmos, in which case there's someone to represent too, in which case we represent the Earth. Either way, all of this science matters. Now, if anybody's um, interested, you may have seen this image before or not. But the pale blue dot that Carl Sagan is referring to, if you look closely just above the four and a little bit off to the right there, that's the dot. That's the Earth suspended in a beam of light that he's talking about. So this is just another instance where, where astronomy and, and chemistry and geology, we can derive meaning from these things. Remember, that's what we're doing. We're saying, is there, is there meaning to be derived from something as objective as science? Ask Carl Sagan. All right, next stop on this journey through the cosmos, we are going to get on the Earth. Earth has been doing its thing for uh, half a billion years now, and um, it's probably about 2.6 billion years on the planet. There's uh, since the since the formation of well, hold on, let me get that straight. Uh, 2.6 billion years ago, so it's about two billion years into the history of the Earth. Uh, there's no life. There's no, you know, nothing has colonized the land. Basically, you've got a planet of uh, geysers, and this is after what's called the late heavy bombardment, when there was still a lot of asteroids crashing into the Earth. And there's a lot of geothermal activity, and there's the water. There's that water. A lot of it was in the rocks and came out, you know, through melt cycles of melting. And a lot of this water probably came back in on comets and and asteroid asteroids and planetesimals that smashed into us. But anyway, we've got this planet that is rich with water. It's got these high, high thermal gradients where uh, magma is heating up this water. There's lots of things dissolved in this water, minerals and salts and strange organic compounds. Not, not meaning that they were produced by life, but they are, but they're complex. They're complex molecules, oily things, greasy things, clay-like things, lots of little molecules that are dissolved and moving around in these in these puddles on the surface of the earth one of the little molecules this little guy strange little thing this is not alive okay this is not a living thing it's called a phospholipid the reason it's called that is because one end it's got phosphorus it's got a phosphate or a phosphorus the other end is a lipid it's kind of waxy it's kind of greasy so it's the little legs with the ends that are long there's long chains of molecules there those are the ones that are waxy so they don't they don't like water we call them hydrophobic so that end of the molecule does not like water hydrophobic the other end are the end with the phosphorus of this phospholipid molecule loves water so you've got this molecule that just by chance of phosphos and lipids coming into into relationship with each other you've got one end that doesn't like water and one then that does. If you let these molecules just self-organize, come together, 
look what they do. They come in, they, they, they organize themselves into lines, then they organize themselves into sheets. And then these sheets come together in a way where the hydrophobic layer can, can keep itself happy away from the water by being insulated where the hydrophilic end can stay in contact with the water that it's dissolved in. So it's this like elegant solution that has been created. Now you've got this, these layers, these are flexible layers and they're moving around in the water, but you know, there's, there's no engineers yet. You know, there's an intelligence operating here in this phospholipid bilayer. That's what this is called where it's figured out a way to keep itself intact. It's, it's figured out a way to take this polarity that it has inherent in its, in its form and, and put it into use to create a new form that keeps it intact, that brings a kind of coherence, that brings a kind of a durability or a, res, a, a resilience to this, to this new structure. Now, here's the cool thing. I'm gonna let this play again. And what you see is what happens is you take this sheet, this purely organic but not living sheet. This is just a different depiction of it. What can happen sometimes when these things are are free to float around in the water is you get these two ends and they're just sort of flopping around. And just given enough time and enough chance, sometimes two of these ends can find each other like that. When that happens, all of a sudden, in the universe, for the first time, you've got this, this entity where there's an inside, inside, and an outside, okay? This is how a purely non-living thing starts to look like life. So life doesn't just happen overnight, you know? You don't go from non-life to life like, like that. It happens slowly like this, things like this that are not really life. Now, when this happens, remember, this is like an oily film, right? It has miscibility. In other words, certain things, it, I'm, just, I'm not going to get too much into science, but it turns out that this feature, this form of this thing, can, it just ex has this exquisite capacity to let certain things through and not other things. It's not a wall that protects the inside. Instead, it's a membrane. It's a surface of contact that selectively lets things go in and out. It's it's not a wall of protection. It's a it's a it's a it's a surface of contact, okay? But it's 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 almost an intelligent surface of contact. It can it can discern things, okay? My point is that this feature, this thing that we're looking at now, goes on to be one of the most essential structures of all living things on Earth. Every cell in your body and every and your dog or cat. Has, is bound by this kind of a membrane. Same exact membrane allows all the functions of living things are because of this membrane that, hap that happened likely in some little, some little pond, some little puddle where this kind of, given enough time and chance, this kind of thing can happen. Um, and it goes on to become, hey, not only that, what we're finding out now is just how important this membrane is to to communication between living organisms. Organisms communicate all kinds of like, like molecules and, and are transferred between living organisms through vesicles made of these kinds of membranes. My point is that science, this is why science matters. Can like, remember that's a polar molecule. It's got, a side that hates water and a side that loves water. But somehow the intelligence of nature figured out a way to turn that polarity into something that would be, then become essential to all life on earth. This is how science matters. You can learn how to get along, you can, or at least get some ideas on how to get along in, in ways that we don't expect when we start really thinking about science in this way all right on to stop four so uh this one here is uh okay this one's really <laughs> crazy too um so life has been chugging along now we've taken that that we've taken that membrane that phospholipid membrane and um unicellular life gets established in that um and then what happens soon after that well 
this is an image of the earth. Well, it's obviously not, but the point is like, this is what we might think of that the earth would have looked like about 2.6 billion years ago. But in actuality, it probably looked something more like this. It probably would have had more of a sort of a grayish, reddish, orangey tinge to it. The oceans would have been a completely different color, probably more like uh, maybe green or reddish. Um, not rust red, but green. Uh, and anyway, so this is sort of an artist depiction of what the the earth would have looked like back then. Now, don't get me wrong. This is a this is a thriving place. Okay, it's just thriving with life that that is fine tuned to this kind of an atmosphere. When I say that, I mean this is not the atmosphere that we have today. This is an atmosphere that's got lots of sulfur and um, ammonia gas and the organisms that are metabolizing here. They're doing a kind of photosynthesis, but it's not the kind that we do today. In fact, they're using things like uh, sulfur instead of water to do their metabolic work. So, but this is a thriving world here. It's just a world that we wouldn't be able to thrive in. We would be suffocated here because there's no oxygen. There's no oxygen in this atmosphere 2.6 billion years ago. So what ends up happening though, is that one little innovative upstart bacterial organism in the oceans figures out a way to capture photons to use the hydrogen that's in water and sunlight to um, combine it, use the, you know, excite some electrons and to create some sugars, some carbon hydrogen bonds to, to store energy and give off some oxygen in the process. This is um, um, oxygen photosynthesis. Oxygenic photosynthesis has now happened in the oceans. Life has figured out a way to to metabolize sunlight and and with oxygen as a byproduct you do this for long enough you release this oxygen gas into the atmosphere and it goes from that gray whatever into this this thing that we sort of recognize as as comfortable and full of air that we can breathe and then it goes from this eventually into the burdened living oxygen rich atmosphere that we all know and love okay so this this event that i'm talking about here where these early photosynthetic organisms completely changed the 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 composition of the early atmosphere from a reducing one into an oxygenating one is called the the great oxygen crisis crisis there's another crisis that i've been talking about the meta crisis well, this was a crisis. This was a real meta crisis too. The point here is that, well, one of the points we can take home from this is that, well, I'm going to go back here to this, to this, to this shot for a second. The point here is that this has happened before. There was a time when an organism on this planet figured out a way to do something, and in the and in the process of prospering from that intervention changed the composition of the atmosphere in a profound and dramatic and irreversible way. It's happened before. So we shouldn't be so hard on ourselves, but we're doing it now. Like it's happening again, right? Like we got to come to terms with that. This is why science matters because it helps us come to terms with the fact that it has happened before and it's happening now. What are we going to do about it? <laughs> That's the question. Can we do anything about it is the question. And if we can't do anything about it, what's what's what does the post world look like? Like, I don't know. Ask the uh, archaea bacteria. Ask the anaerobic bacteria that are now relegated to live in in the deep, you know, deep ocean where there's no oxygen, where they can still thrive down there, but they can't live in the oxygen-rich world that we inhabit. Who's going to inhabit the worlds that we're creating now? It's 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 a good question. Anyway, I think the one who put the man who put it best, uh, the the meaning that 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 um, comes out of this is is this: no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. The point here is is that 
there is nothing permanent except change. And I think this is a kind of meaning that we can derive when we know the story of science, the science, the story that science is telling us about the world. All right, here's our, our last stop on the cosmic journey here. Um, it's covering a lot of ground. That early photosynthetic life ends up evolving into multicellularity. Lots of things happen. The Cambrian explosion happens. We see this real adaptive radiation of life, all kinds of new life forms, all kinds of setbacks, ice ages, asteroid impacts, all kinds of things happen, but eventually a little mammalian shrew-like creature gets a chance when the dinosaurs go extinct, and um, that creature ends up evolving into a, a, a warm-blooded furry creature, uh, and that's where we are now. So we pick up the story about 7 million years ago. Uh, this is a Sahelanthropus species living somewhere, probably in Central Africa, um, and I like to imagine... Um, that this species evolves, and this is an Australopithecine, and there these these species are are moving through all the different habitats of Africa, encountering all these species, all these different animals and habitats. And we're talking about hundreds of million, well, at least two hundred million years of evolution of doing this, and we, and we have a lot of this. The stories that happened are starting to be found in these uh, footprints, and you can reconstruct events. And you can see them moving through all these different habitats and adapting. And I like to think that one day, perhaps, they were they were moving along and they had these seed pods. And one of them saw some rocks and decided that it would be a good idea to hit two rocks together in order to create a sharp edge so that they could open up the seed pods. And, and voila, they had stone tools were invented. And what we're seeing here, really, if you think about it, is the is the emergence of storytelling capacity, which I mentioned early in in early hominids, but this kind of stone tool ended up evolving into this one. I don't know if you can feel the difference, but I sure can. When I look at this, and then I feel this, it's a big difference. Whatever hominid, probably Homo, um, probably Homo habilis, who made this one. This is uh, uh, um, whoever made this uh, hand axe um, really had a fine appreciation for symmetry. This one here is a another, it's called a Mousterian hand tool. It's made by this technique called Lavawa, where you, you hit it in a sequence of, of chips and you create a surface. And then with the final blow, you create the piece that you're looking for. It's a it's kind of a it requires quite a cognitive, a complex cognitive sequence in order to pull something like this off. Um, if you try it, you'll see what I mean. But really what we're talking about here is. The emergence of metaphor because in order to be able to see the tool that you want in the base tool that you have to be able to see one thing in terms of another is the capacity for metaphor and what we see is that these early hominids they leave africa with these capacities of storytelling aesthetic appreciation and metaphor and they encounter things like this in their environment and then suddenly they're creating things like this they're representing the creatures that they encounter and the world that they live in through this new symbolic capacity to, in the way that they manipulate stones and, and, and wood and ivory. And so that when they encounter things like this, elk swimming across this lake, they carve things like this. And that just the, the detail and the amount of knowledge that it's required to do this, it just, it just reveals the intimacy by which these these people lived with their environments. And when they see things like this, they represent it in this sort of semi-abstract way in the cave wall, and they see this, and then they, this is a single a, a bone um, disc, and it has a, an image on either side. And when you put it together in a certain way on a piece of leather, and you spin it in this way, suddenly you've animated this, this antelope to do this thing called starting. It's like, this is like the first animated movie my point is this, that the earth is teaching us. You see, you see what's happening here, that, that this species, this hominid species is leaving Africa. And, and it, as it moves through all the different habitats of this planet, it's taught how to do things. So 
It moves through jungles and across savannas and, and near estuaries and through swamps and, and near mountains and even across oceans. Eventually, it ends up doing metaphor. And so what we have is cavemen doing Shakespeare, eventually doing Shakespeare. The stones have taught us how to do Shakespeare. And so this is this is it. Like Shakespeare says, and this our life exempt from public haunt finds tongues and trees, books and the running brooks, sermons and stone and good and everything. My point here is that what we see here is paleoanthropology, the study of how stone tool, how human beings came to be able to fashion stone tools and the cognitive capacities that it requires to do that eventually becomes art. That's why science matters, because art, I was originally going to call this talk, Why Art Matters. I ended up calling it Why Science Matters, but you end up at the same place. They, Who says that? Why Science matters because art. When you, when you understand enough science, you understand why art matters. And, and then telling the story of science artistically is you understand why science matters. This is, um, this is, all of this, again, is really just an, an exercise in how do we derive meaning from this story? So that's what we've done here. That's what I've done is to just take this story and, and, and go along and, and just stop briefly at these different stops along the way until eventually we come out here and then lo and behold, we find meaning. That's the idea here is to, the question was, why does science matter? Well, for all the reasons that I just spelled out, if you understand and you really look at the scientific story of the universe, it, you realize when science matters, this is what you get. Your values tend to align with the ecological constraints. It's just that simple. When science matters, there are no unassailable dogmas. Okay, everybody's sacred cow gets gored. Everything's provisional and adaptable. When science matters, it allows for accessing a fascinating and inexhaustible fount of meaning. When science matters, it links us to an unfolding story of awe and the human presence in the cosmos. When science matters, it is convivial. In other words, that it tends to cultivate a sense of embedded participation with life. When science matters, what we reveal is how the differentiation is contextualized by continuity. We'll have to just let that sink in, but think about all those stories that I talked about where something was differentiating, but it wasn't differentiating in, in, dis, in isolation from what was before and what was after. It was all along a continuum. It's differentiation along a, a continuum. Um, and when science matters, it links meaning to knowledge and knowledge to wisdom. Okay, so back to Verveke. We are in a meaning crisis. Are you kidding me? This is my question. I love John, but I'm just saying, like, how, and he, how can we be in a meaning crisis when we have this story of the universe available to us through science? And somehow we've come to believe that we are in a meaning crisis, that the meta crisis is a meaning crisis. And so my point here, my proposal, is that no longer should science be discounted or excluded as a source of meaning. They should all be. And just to bring this back home and to put it into the context of tonight's talk, how about this quote? I'm blown away by this. The greatest benefit from the study of science is that it lifts you out of and above the littleness of daily trials. We learn to live in the universe as a part of it. We cannot separate ourselves from it. Our every act connects us with it. Our every act affects the whole. Can you imagine who would have said that? It's, <laughs> of course, she understood the universe in, you know, in her Victorian way. But I can just imagine if she were alive today, she would precisely know what it is that I'm proposing tonight. And I think that's why I'm here tonight. So, that's it for my talk. Uh, that's why science matters. I'm happy to stick around and uh, take any questions um, or uh, anything anybody wants to talk about. I hope that was um, enjoyable for folks. And if anybody wants to learn more, 
you just uh, check me out at uh, oika.com, seven o'clock. So that's one hour on the nose. <laughs> you crushed it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Dr. Blundell, thank you so much for your wonderful sure. presentation on why science matters. And I'm sure that most of us are bursting at the seams with questions. I would like to share with the audience this evening that if you have any questions that you'd like to pose to Dr. Blondell, you can go ahead and type that in the Q&A box. Or if you raise your hand and I see your hand raised, I can give you speaking permission through Zoom if that appeases you guys this evening. And while we wait for people's questions to stew and bubble, I guess I'd like to unpack a few things but first, I'll start with why did you opt to not include AI in your chart? I I would have included it. It's what's interesting is that that's the World Economic Forum. They didn't include it. Mm -hmm. I definitely would have included it. I think it's the I think it's the most important issue of our time. I think it's um, yeah. So I mean, and and while we're on the subject. I happen to think that this thing that I'm proposing here, how we reconnect with the deep source of nature's intelligence, is what we're going to find is that that is the most appropriate response to the challenges that the AI is going to present us with. If you if you really think about what's going on with the AI, like the, the first point, the first iteration of AI was the algorithms that that tech companies like Facebook subjected us to, right? It was like this curation about how they 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 made decisions about what information made it to individuals. That's curation. That's them deciding through algorithmic means what information that we were going to be exposed to. The next wave of it, which is what we're feeling now, is an AI that actually generates that content. It doesn't just curate the content. It, it creates the content and, and delivers it. And then there's a third one, which is where it just goes and does it. It basically takes over. It, it controls. It goes from curation to creation to control. And um, that sequence of events is is a hard one to come up with appropriate responses to. My proposal is that human beings reconnecting with that story of the cosmos that I've been telling. When you start to see the intelligence that's operating there. That's that's not in us, but in the world. That's why I tell that story of humans and how they're the you know there are books out there I won't name names, but that talk about how the human species is just this incredible species that shows up with all these skills to adapt and extract and exploit its environment. That is an absolutely asinine way to see the world. What I'm trying to say with that Earthling theory thing that I was saying is that. We didn't just show up with those capacities. The world taught us those capacities. It's the earth that's teaching us those intelligences through relationship. The same relationship that's inherent in the whole of the cosmos is now expressing itself through the relationships between humans and habitats. Habitats are endowing us with the intelligences that we somehow have come to think are ours alone. They're not ours. They're the, they're the way that earth has been teaching us. My point is this, that, and this gets back to the AI, it's that understanding of who we are and the depth and the, the source and the how our, where our intelligence comes from that is going to be the best and the most appropriate response to how we deal with the artificial intelligence that's being imposed on us. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. And I know that might sound controversial, but when when you really do get a sense for the continuity of this story that I've been telling and how the intelligence moves through it and, and, and is now embedded within us, you realize that that's going to be the, that's going to be the way that we, that we best respond to and manage and work with what we call artificial intelligence. Sorry if that went off the, off too, too too far with your question, but I would have included AI in there. I think that we're going to have to start including it in 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 a lot more conversations. Well, I guess my follow up question would be, and it may be a little vague, is how would you correlate 
technology or the climate change experience as a result of technology to the human climate change. So the physical climate change that we're seeing in the world and the human climate change as a, as a result of technology and artificial intelligence, or is there not a correlation there in your opinion? Or a parallel perhaps? Can you, re can you ask the question again? Mm -hmm. So I just got to thinking about artificial intelligence and how it's changed the human climate. And it you mean the actual climate? So the human climate, like me as a human as a whole, how does technology impact and change my life? How has it automated a lot ah, of processes okay, okay. in our lives? How we've become overly dependent in some areas on technology. Okay. Okay, and I'm okay. just curious as to your thoughts on how it could parallel potentially with the actual climate change that we experience. And there might not be a parallel, just something I just thought of as you should. I think there are. I think there 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 are and they're they're scary. Mm-hmm. Because look what happened last time the climate changed like that, the actual climate. It's it's irreversible. It's and and the things that used to thrive are now, you know, I'm, I'm not making a judgment, but they're just they're relegated to 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 a lot less habitats. Um you make a lot of analogies there, but they're starting to sound like science fiction. Um, I can, I'm not going to do that, but I'm just saying, yeah, I mean, you could make a lot of, you could, you could make a lot of, um, um, speculative, um, scenarios. Um, but I will say this, that whatever the scenario plays out, I know it will be better if whatever we do is aligned with the intelligence of nature versus somehow not mm -hmm. any culture or society or civilization that thinks it's going to survive in the cosmos by de decoupling its intelligence from nature is a short-lived endeavor because because look you you want to go to the stars the stars are nature too <laughs> you know what i mean and so to decouple your the ethos of your civilization from nature, it just doesn't sound like a smart way to go. And so whatever we do, I think uh, we'll, that, that, that's not to say, again, I'm not saying, I'm not proposing that we go back to the Paleolithic or, you know, anything like that. I'm just saying that working with being in alliance with nature, as opposed to working against it is, 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 is a no brainer. And the way to do that, I think is to, know it is to just simply know the story and be able to tell the story in meaningful ways and that's what i'm trying to do with this tell that story in meaningful ways. so i just stopped in on you know i just stopped in on five different sciences astronomy phys astronomy chemistry geology biology and paleoanthropology they've all got meaning embedded within them we just don't we don't we don't use it as a source of meaning we use all these other things that were on that list so. so would you say that we are disconnected from nature's language as a society and as a populace at large? At large, I would say that, yeah, I think in the evidence for that is the super wicked problem. It's the, it's the meta crisis. That is the debt that I think if you need evidence for that, I'm not, I don't, I wouldn't say that anyone in particular is that way, but collectively, obviously we are. Otherwise we wouldn't be staring at a cliff off the edge of the cliff that, as we are now. Mm -hmm. I think that's how we back away from the cliff. So how do you propose we gain more buy-in on changing the human climate or realigning the human climate? I think we, uh, first of all, we need to call on artists in this. Art's an incredibly powerful and sidelined force at this point. And so we need to, that's, uh, that's powerful. And also just be willing to, reinterpret the science that we know and not not maintain this allergy of of deriving meaning from science i know i know the tension there i know the conflict because i'm trained in the sciences and i work in the world and i work with meaning generation i know what it, i know the difference between knowledge production and meaning production and 
I just think that it needs to be less of an anta antagonistic relationship. I know that it needs to do good science, and I think that's incredibly important. But I just think that uh, we need to be more open to to being able to make meaning of science. Carl Sagan did it. You know, you know, we just we need more Carl Sagans. That's what I mean. So where do we start? Not in college. <laughs> Well, it's a good question. Uh, it's hard to do it through the educational system because it's entrenched and because it's hard mm -hmm. to change. As you know, it's very hard to change. Even mm -hmm. though it wants to change, it's hard to change. I think culture, that's that's why I think artists are an incredibly important part because you can change culture still. And mm -hmm. um, it's hard though, especially in the face of curated content. You know, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of, um, um, you know, Incentive, incentivization behind the way things are done. And um, so I don't know. I, 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 all I know is how to do, well, all I know how to do is to tell, tell stories and get excited about science and um, be willing to let other people see it. I wouldn't say that that's all you know how to do. You do that quite well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> And at home, just as a reminder, if you have any questions for Dr. Blundell that you'd like to pop in the Q&A chat box, please go ahead and do so, so that I don't commandeer this entire conversation. So we have multiple viewpoints or questions. In the meantime, can you further unpack the statement, the values align with the ecological constraints? That one up to my attention. Uh, well, the first part of that is that when science matters, mm -hmm then the values that we derive from science, which is mm -hmm. that's what this was an exercise in doing, are already aligned to ecological constraints because they are coming from ecological stories. They're not invented stories. They're coming from, you know, they're coming from observed phenomena of nature, which which place, you know, so, they will be stories constrained not and I don't, when i say constrained i don't that's not a negative thing it's that it, it's that they're really it's that they're grounded that they are they are linked to a much larger source of intelligence and wisdom than you know than than mere you know fantasy you know they they're, they're grounded in nature's intelligence that's what I mean. And so if they're if they are coming from nature, if they're aligned with nature, then they're going to be they're going to have embedded within them ecological dynamics already. That's that's what I'm trying to say, that uh, they, they will be implicitly, organically um, ecological when they come from ecological systems. And I don't mm -hmm. just mean, you know, like nature, like the way we think of it. I mean, the mm -hmm. cosmos, the whole of the cosmos is an ecosystem. That's what the cosmic microwave background is showing us. It's like, whoa, it started as an ecosystem of light. And now it's an ecosystem of trees and, and birds and everything else and people. What, where do we go next? Intentionally vague. <laughs> Oh, big? You mean big? No, vague. I mean, I'm being intentionally, oh, intentionally vague. vague. Um, I think. Um, I think. Well, for for you know, for me, I just keep doing what I'm doing, and uh, keep trying to get this understood, and uh, just keep trying that, and and hopefully, uh, if it works, it it shifts the consciousness in some small way and and you know and someone else shifts it in a small way and then that the collective shift at some point is you know discernible and um who knows you know you, and it may or may not be discernible in any one any particular lifetime you know but the good news is that it, it sure is beautiful and sure is fascinating and meaningful 
um, in the process. And so even if there is, even if the shift is not discernible in any particular lifetime, you get to participate in something. You get to, you know, that that's, uh, that's very rewarding. Amazing. I hate to ask another question, but I'm going to. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Given your intimacy with the life cycle of our planet, and correct me if I if that's an incorrect statement, but I find you to be very closely familiar with it. Yeah, it feels that way. <laughs> Do you feel as though that there is hope for us to realign and recalibrate, so to say, before the effects uh, or the impacts yeah. are too much? I'm, I'm very hopeful. And you know why? Because when you are intimate with it and you see how it works, when mm -hmm. you see how powerful this ally is, mm -hmm. it's so fascinating because, man, like if you, it, it, it's just that, you know, we, we, it, it's such a big problem, right? We're, we're in mm -hmm. such, we have such a big, complex, difficult problem before us. It makes you think that man, the solution must be big and difficult. It must mm -hmm. gonna be. It must require a lot of suffering and a lot of sacrifice in order to solve this problem. But here's the thing: once you have that intimacy that you're talking about, once you see how it works, you realize, mm -hmm. oh, it's not hard. It doesn't take a lot of suffering. This isn't about sacrifice and compromise. It's about getting in touch with something that's really beautiful, mm -hmm. and and fulfilling and like hopeful and like suddenly and then once that tiny little shift happens it does the work it you know like you just let nature's intelligence because that's what it does you know the healing doesn't require a lot of it just requires allowing oneself to feel that sense of intimacy that sense of belonging and then suddenly things start to really that sense that that the healing power of the, of nature's intelligence is so powerful that we don't we don't even, we don't know how to even acknowledge it mm -hmm. right that's why i'm hopeful because as long as if we just like let take the hands off the wheel a little bit it suddenly you feel the power of that of that intelligence go to work so it's it's not about hard sacrifice and work and pain and suffering and guilt and shame it's about allowing oneself to feel close to that sense of creative beauty and all of that. I know that all sounds very naive, but it's not. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm hopeful. I appreciate that. That gives me hope. Genuinely. Yeah. yeah. I would say, do you envision AI and technology as an entire lumped concept? being which side of the scale do you imagine it tips us toward toward realigning or just further catapulting ourselves in to a deeper trench per se that we need to climb out of well it depends it's it's i'm i'm not afraid of the technology i'm afraid of who wields it mm -hmm. and what and why that okay. um and so Whatever it is, and whatever the technology does, mm -hmm. it will um, it will reflect us. That's why we got to get ourselves straightened out. We got to mm -hmm. we have to do we have to improve our inner climate. Right. And then I'm not worried about the AI at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, it will reflect whatever our inner climate is. Right. So. Yeah, that that I guess that's my answer to that. No, I appreciate that yeah. answer. Yeah. It aligns with kind of where I fall mm. on that scale. Because I do think if we care is not the word I'd like to use, but I, I'm gonna stick with recalibrate. If we're able to recalibrate as a populace, as a human climate. I, I like the idea. I like the idea of just remembering. Yeah. In, yeah. in like remembering and then remembering. Mm-hmm. And it'll it does the rest nature does the rest and how does the james webb space telescope images how do they 
drive your storytelling or your understanding of the history of the earth? You know, the funny thing is I haven't had a chance to really spend too much time with the images yet. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to that. But I do, I'm really excited about the way that it is giving us visual uh, confirmation of things, you know, that we otherwise only had modeling for in the past. That's really fascinating. Um, I I just think um, that's the other thing too, is that it's subtle, but what ends up happening is that the data that we're collecting, it ends up conforming or slightly not conforming to what we already know not to not to what we already know but it fits in it 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 it, it affirms in a, in a way it'll and that is really powerful because it's another line of evidence that either you know it's slightly adjusts but nothing's like nothing's showing up that's so out of out of line with our our models and our theories I understand like there's there's a, there's like the threat or the, the danger of instrumentalism, which is like you only design instruments to see the, the theories that you can, that it confirms those thing, theories because you design the instrument to see things that confirm right. it. I know about that danger, but the point is just that what it is seeing and the way that it is confirming our theories about things in a way that you, that is consistent with them being accurate. Mm-hmm. I know that sounds very, com- like that's like, sounds and uh, like I'm hedging, what I'm saying is that the fact that it's that's good, like that's, Mm -hmm. that means that we have a pretty accurate picture of cosmic evolution. When, Mm -hmm. when the, when the observed data that we're getting with the best instruments doesn't fall perfectly in line, but well in line enough so that we can, that we can adjust without having to throw out the whole, the whole theory. And I may oversimplify this, but for me, it, it alludes to our wisdom being inherently connected with the knowledge that we've gained. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good, that's a good definition of wisdom that it's, that it's already coherent, that it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's cogent with, mm-hmm. with, the, with what we know. Right. It's a knowing that we already have the knowledge perhaps gives us a tool or a means to access the wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. But not perfect. Cause it's not no. like, yeah it's like it's not like perfectly right because that would worry me if it were (laughs) it would be like yeah that's a little too good to be true right be scary i would agree yeah yeah. we have it's great to see it's great to see the uh, accretionary disc stuff coming in too just yeah i love that stuff we have a comment from a guest kathleen who says hi this was what absolutely wonderful i do not have any type of science background but the entire presentation resonated with me I would love to rewatch so that I can fully absorb all of what you touched on. And she said, thank you with a smiley face. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you too. Kat. Thank you. Any parting thoughts you'd like to share with us? No, I don't think so. I think that was pretty good. I just really appreciate the opportunity to, you know, have come here and, um, and explore this stuff and, and develop these ideas and, um, and start telling these stories and uh, it's a perfect place to do it I'm, I'm constantly amazed at how mariah mitchell knew this stuff in mm-hmm. her own way you know and in her own constrained way constrained by her culture of her time and the science of her time mm-hmm. i think she'd be right here with us i think she would have been right in you know and and i'm also i'm just so grateful to know that there is an organization that's positioned to, to be able to pr- appreciate this there's not many i can't think of any others who have held on to that legacy of hers in a way that you know can now find expression today you know mm-hmm. that it, it's almost like it has survived modernism like that like this this organization mariah mitchell happened to come of age in a time when you know enlightenment science was kind of reaching its its apex and then mm-hmm. you know with you know, ever since then, after the Victorian era, we we ended up, you know, after the Industrial Revolution and all that, we got we got very philosophical, and then we got into postmodernism, and now we're starting to come out the other side of that. And here is this organization, you know, and this institution really that has survived that, and now 
perhaps we can start to um you know keep keep the science alive in a way that is you know that that can be really meaningful you know um yeah so so i'm hopeful about that it's it's really great to see that i like to think in my heart that her connection to nature her connection to the earth mm. in that time you know is it's her wisdom it's her knowing and her knowing is what drove mm -hmm. her to seek more knowledge and to marry those two things together in mm -hmm. real time. So, and, and, and the, and the nature that she would have encountered, it's those think those intelligences, those cues mm -hmm. that nature gives, especially mm -hmm. the ones that we experience here on these trails and in these forests and on these beaches are the same ones that she would have. And those they're universal. So whatever, mm -hmm. whatever cues she got, we get. And mm -hmm. so we're drinking from the same well. And I think right. that's, that's that's important that's that's that matters i would agree mm -hmm. it's a perfect note to close on <laughs> all right Thanks again, if you'd Gina. like to share with our audience any upcoming things on the horizon for you with us sure before... yeah we we've got a really uh, i don't know if you remember we did a really cool show here an oika art show at the at the gallery here on 33 um one of the artists free laduke and i have a um, a really cool new exhibition starting up at the Museum of the White Mountains in New Hampshire. And we're bringing these ideas and this whole idea, this whole idea of making meaning that, that this lecture was about, this idea of making meaning with nature, we're bringing to the White Mountains. And so we've been, you know, for the last two years, we've been going up to this field, this experimental uh, forest up there. And we've been going into the forest and making meaning in this, much the same way that Mariah Mitchell and I did here this summer, um, not not me and Ryan Mitchell, but the way that Ryan Mitchell would have, and the way that I have this summer, um, we have an exhibition. It's called um, "Making Meaning with the White Mountains." Uh, it's at the Museum of the White Mountains, which is associated with Plymouth State University. You can get to that through my website, oika.com. You can pretty much figure. You can learn about all the different things we've got going on at uh, oika.com. But that that's that's an upcoming exciting thing that we've got going on. And your next program with us. Oh yeah, rocks. Uh we're doing the uh rock pro rock talk uh this Friday and then the following Saturday for the next two weeks. So we're gonna it's gonna be really cool. Uh gonna talk about the geology of Nantucket, which really is talking about the geology of the eastern seaboard, which isn't really cool that when you think about when you put the geology of Nantucket in the context of the geology of New England and the and then the last 500 million years of geology on this planet and then the following day uh, we're going to do a walk on a place I haven't figured out yet but we're going to do a walk where I teach how to think like a geologist and we're going to go and look at all the different stones and see you know actual rocks from Nantucket that tell the story that I told in the lecture the night before. Amazing. Well, we're definitely excited for your Me upcoming too. programs. And I'm very hopeful that I can catch you and Rita in New Hampshire. It'd be great to see you. I love the White Mountains. So. <laughs> Me too. Well, Dr. Blundell, Rich, it's such an honor always to have these conversations with you. I feel like I always unpack something new of my own wisdom and my own knowing that causes me or results in me have forcing myself to seek more knowledge. So I'm just always just so grateful and appreciative of the conversations that you steward. And it's been our absolute honor and privilege to host you for our science speaker series on September 13th, 2023. And we hope to hear more from you soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you to Bank of America, our lead sponsor, Cisco Brewers and White Elephant Hotels and Resorts of Nantucket and Palm Beach. And I wish everyone a happy Wednesday evening. Go enjoy your dinner and I will see you guys soon. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thanks. I know that was like kind of out there, but it is what it is. <laughs> no, you're great. Okay. And let me stop recording. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. And people are exiting at the same time. Okay.